Yeah, I mean, this is probably the only way anyone would ever be able to eat meat in space. And actually, we were invested in specifically by uh, an investment firm that, that focuses entirely on space because they know that this is kind of the only option. So we're, we're very, very uh, excited to be the first fish in space. I do know that because of human pollutive activities, we're going to end up with more plastic in the ocean by weight than fish by 2050 is the estimate that I've seen. So that's like well within our lifetimes. And at that point, we're going to have, you know, an ocean that's completely filled with plastic. Like what are we going to do in order to get food from that? I think we should A, stop poisoning the ocean and B, start to move our food sources out of it. Welcome to Fringe FM, the podcast that explores the edges of human understanding and looks at the technologies, trends, and societal norms shaping our collective future. Here, the world's top minds share their insights and predictions on the convergence, direction, and ethics of exponential technologies transforming life as we know it. You can learn more and stay up to date at fringe.fm. They're using cutting edge cellular agriculture technologies to grow marine animals from cells, creating fish and seafood around the world. It's the sci fi future that's here today, delectable, healthy, and great for the environment. In today's wide ranging discussion, we'll discuss the clean meat revolution and the end of animal agriculture, how Mike's company, Finless Foods, is growing fish in a laboratory, it's real, the exciting science of food tech, why people need to embrace GMOs, how agriculture is increasingly driving climate change, why we aren't far off from fully growing human usable organs and how will fuel humanity's rise and expansion in space. Without further ado, I give you Mike Selden. Just a quick note, we wanted to apologize for the audio on Mike's side. We did the best we could. It got a little bit garbled up at times, but it's easy to follow and incredibly valuable. Now I give you Mike Selden. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Yeah, so what we're doing is basically trying to give consumers a, a, a different choice than the one they're faced with right now. Right now, people have the choice between the food that they like and the food that's good for the environment. You know, fishing has so many detrimental environmental effects and aquaculture, while better, still has a lot of like difficulties. I'm super sorry about that. Still has a lot of like bad things that sort of need to be mitigated. So what we're trying to do is change that choice for people. So what we're doing is creating the same fish, meat that people are used to eating, but we're just using a different production method. So it's not vegan or vegetarian per se, and that it's not made of plants. It is real meat, but we are making it by taking a small sample of real meat from a real fish and then growing that out indefinitely until we end up with meat that is large enough to feed a mass of people. So basically you're creating sci-fi meat that requires no death. Exactly. We're creating real meat without killing animals and without needing like massive environmental resources. We don't need boats going out onto the ocean to do all the fishing that re- fishing uh, that fish currently requires. We're not needing large mariculture, aquaculture facilities where you fish farm in these big uh, facilities off- offshore that require lots of insecticides, fungicides, uh, herbicides, pesticides that create these big ocean dead zones. We don't need large fleets of boats. We don't need to give people all of the mercury and plastic that's currently in fish. It's just a cleaner, better, more efficient system that can grow fish that's healthier and quicker and more efficiently than the systems that currently exist. That leads me to a million different questions. But the first and most obvious one is, why is this, at least for most people, the first time that they're hearing about clean meat? And why is this not more prevalent? It's become possible with recent advances in technology. Some really like boring sounding technology that's recently come out has really, really helped spur this industry into into overdrive and really made it possible for us to do this type of work. Hey, Matt here. I'd like to point out the obvious but often overlooked fact. Notice Mike said how there was technology that recently came out that had suddenly opened up the industry. This is almost always how it works. We have technological breakthroughs and suddenly entire new industries are created, the industries of the future. So I would just invite everyone, entrepreneurs and otherwise, to look at those changes as they happen and to try to react. Like it would be pretty much impossible for us to do the work that we're doing without this really fast sequencing technology that has, has become popular in the past few years. And so while that technology to most people, it's like, okay, you can read my DNA very quickly. That sounds really boring. To us, it's extremely important for iterating our process and actually understanding what's going on inside of these cells in a deep enough way to really create something new with them. And what, what led you to this field? I, you know, was a vegan for a long time, uh, for like about six years. And then uh, I basically have just always had a background in agriculture, studied biochemistry and molecular biology at UMass Amherst, which is a traditionally agricultural school. And I was just thinking about how incredibly inefficient animal agriculture is. It's like this awful system that just has so much waste and, and so many other externalities that really are completely unnecessary. And 
if you were ever going to design like, you know, a fish steak from the ground up and like the system to produce it, you would never have designed a fish. It's just not an efficient system. A fish swims around. It has all these like life processes that it has to do. It, it has organs that function. It moves. It, it thinks. And uh, all these things are wastes of energy. So if you're thinking about this in terms of agriculture, you want to have the least amount of energy put in to the most amount of product put out. And so an entire animal isn't really a good way to do that when you can just grow it from cells. Did you come at it more from an empathy or an engineering standpoint initially? And this is a, a good question from our company. Myself, my co-founder come at it from opposite points of view. For me, it was an empathy thing. And for him, it was an engineering thing. So the two of us together have, have got sort of the the brains and the soul of the company uh, when schools work together. For me, it was really um, an empathy thing. And also like, I've always just been really concerned with like food justice and social justice. And I, I just, there are so many people who don't have access to clean sources of protein that can actually deliver uh, high levels of nutrients for a, an affordable cost. And I think that there are better ways that we can do this. So I really like to, you know, there's this whole like crusade for healthy food, but it seems sort of more like a social movement. I think that we can really, instead of trying to get people moralistically on board and get people to like, and get corporations moralistically on board, which is more or less possible, we can sort of shift the means of production themselves into a more gentle and, and better practice to produce better food for people. I'm very for like shifting things at the base. Of, I'm not, uh, I'm not an individualist. I don't really think that people's individual choices can make an extreme amount of difference in the world. But I think that collectively or on the production side, the supply side of things, we really can shift things massively by changing things um, upstream. So basically it's the Tesla example of you've got to make something better, cheaper, so that people don't have a choice. They have to go to the, the better thing, essentially. Exactly. How far off are we from a cost parity perspective? What, what's it cost right now to, to make a fish steak or what type, of, what, what type of entree, so to speak, can you guys, can you guys manufacture? <laughs> a very expensive one. We, uh, well, we made our first prototypes back in September that we served to a crowd of about 25 people. That was about the very, very low and affordable price of $19,000 per pound, which, you know, while very attainable for the average person, we felt it wasn't really low enough. So we ended up basically just going uh, beyond that. And, and just in the past few months, we've lowered our cost massively to where we're now below $7,000 per pound. So just in the past few months, we've already jumped the price down by massive leaps and bounds, but it's still obviously, you know, nowhere near cheap enough for anyone to actually buy. We plan on achieving price parity with our first set of of products, which is a uh, bluefin tuna by the uh, end of 2019, beginning of 2020. Which sounds absolutely absurd. How are you guys, how are you forecasting this? Is this some type of Moore's law? How are the price, price, the curves coming down? Yeah. I mean, really we're pushing on a few different price levers. Our, our biggest price levers are three things and all of them are sort of centered around the exact same concept, which is the inputs into this system. Cells need to eat just like animals need to eat and they eat similar things. So these cells eat these ingredients, that salts, sugars, and proteins that we give them. And um, we just need to make uh, the first level we can push is making those things cheaper. So we need to make those ingredients cheaper, which is sort of a, a big chunk of our technology. And I can go into that if you're interested. The second component of this is recycling. Some of these ingredients that we're feeding the cells don't actually get taken apart by the cells or destroyed by the cells. They're just signals. They come in and tell the cells that they need to divide and eat the other ingredients. Those are our most expensive ingredients and we can recycle them. So we need to create better recycling systems. It's something that's already very possible in cellular production. We just need to adapt to it. And then the third lever that we can press is uh, cell densities, having the cells use these ingredients more efficiently. So all these things are really components of the same thing, which is their input cost, where to, to review, it's getting the input cost down, cycling the input and then having the inputs used more efficiently by themselves. So you're, ba you're basically bringing on engineers that can make things more efficient and probably have some type of production capacity or experience with, with pharma or creating other types of medicines in a similar fashion? Yeah, we've got people from all sorts of things from, you know, food to pharma and everything in between. Yeah, we're, it's, it's really a big effort in cost dropping because we already know how to do 3D organ printing. Like that's a technology that's been around for a while. The problem that they're having is they can't get those organs to function inside of the human body. But for us in creating this, this fish meat, it actually doesn't matter. We don't need the fish meat to function at all. We just need it to be cheaper. So we're taking that technology that they were using to create these 3D organs and print 3D organs and just making it affordable. Devil's advocate, what are people doing in terms of cloning? Are people looking at something similar? You're kind of cloning, but you're only cloning uh, a small portion. Is this something where people are also exploring just cloning animals? I wouldn't really say what we're doing is cloning. It's a bit of a different technology. What we're doing is really just cell division. We're taking the natural biochemical process that happens inside of a fish and replicating it outside of a fish. Your cells inside of your body right now are dividing, and that's normal. And we're just taking them and, and letting them do what they want to do. It, it turns out that if you give cells enough space and enough nutrients to survive, they will just divide. And they'll divide at very, very quick rates. 
And this is not something that we've like programmed them to do or showed them how to do. It's just sort of what they already know how to do. And we're just giving them the opportunity to do it. Who are some of the other players in the space, not just fish, but otherwise? Well, there's all sorts of people. I mean, the community is really great. It's filled with tons of people who are really, really dedicated to, to working to make something better for people. We were hugely inspired by the companies that came before us. I mean, Memphis Meats is sort of, you know, the, the, the leader in the, the land animal space, and we're trying to become the leader in the, in the fish and seafood space. They're making chicken and duck, which is really in, uh, like exciting, and, and they're a bit further along than we are. They have a bit more money, a bit more people on their staff. They have this big new facility. And so they, um, they were a big inspiration for us. <clears throat> I came out of a nonprofit called New Harvest, which is working in the nonprofit sector. Uh, they're taking donor money and putting it towards grants that can be used by PhD students to do this work. We were super inspired by Dr. Post over in the Netherlands, Dr. Mark Post. He has a company called Mosa Meats, which is working on beef. There's um, uh, Clara Foods in South San Francisco working on egg whites, Perfect Day, that's actually just a few blocks from us, working on milk proteins, Geltor in San Leandro doing gelatin. All these people were like, not just like really inspiring for us, but also mentors in a lot of ways. They've all been, it's just a great community to be in of people who all have the same mission and really want to work together to achieve it. Would you say for most people in the industry, it's more about the, the engineering or the emphasis side of things and ending industrial farming of animals? You know, you end up talking about both so often that I don't even know if there's a way to separate it anymore. I, I think that most of us like <clears throat> came at it from an, an empathy point of view and an environmentalist point of view. And now we're so entrenched in the engineering that like it's definitely half and half. I mean, at this point, it's like our entire life's work. I mean, I can only really speak for myself, but for me, it's like it's if it was just an engineering problem, I would not be interested in it. No, I really want to do something that has impact. I want to do something that changes the world for the better. Quick aside, as an angel investor and someone who's worked with numerous startups, you see companies, they come, they go, they succeed, they fail. The ones that succeed are the ones that can persevere, that are obsessed about a mission and become driven to make that product or that vision a reality. Mike's one of those entrepreneurs. Most entrepreneurs aren't. Typically, if you just go for the money, you don't end up building something incredible and lasting because it is just a roller coaster. And it's so hard to come up from some of those lows so that... You really do need a driving force. Now let's jump back to it. And Mike's driving force. Um, that said, the engineering is really interesting. And it's, it's really fun to like, see it happen on a day-to-day -day basis. How will you know when you've succeeded? Oh, we'll have succeeded when we can... I mean, there's so many goals that we have in this. But we'll have succeeded when we can provide healthy food for people. And we'll, we'll also have succeeded when we can sort of lower the toll that we're taking on the ocean by fish production. We'll have succeeded when we can uh, cut plastic and mercury in people's diets. We'll, you know, we'll have succeeded when we can create localized fish production in places that previously had no access to it. Because right now, when you get fish, you have to get it from the ocean generally. And that is difficult for people who live far inland. And we can create like a localized system of production for those people so they can have healthy protein that they previously had no access to. Not all of those things, one of those things, some combination of those things, any like all of those things I would consider to be just an absolute victory. The other implications, of course, are as we start to go ideally interplanetary, it's it's very easy if you can bring a factory with you that produces bringing animals is a, another story. Noah's Ark isn't going to fly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is probably the only way anyone would ever be able to eat meat in space. And actually, we were invested in specifically by uh, an investment firm that, that focuses entirely on space because they know that this is kind of the only option. So we're very, very uh, excited to be the first fish in space. What company or what, what farm? Uh, they're called Hemisphere Ventures. They're based out of Seattle, a really great group of people. How do you, how do you work with VCs enable, or in terms of working with either them or their portfolio companies for Synergy? We consider like when a VC has invested in us, we really want to make that our ecosystem in a, in a lot of ways. We want to help the other companies in the portfolio and we want to really have like a synergetic approach to them. So, you know, for VCs themselves, they are resource. They are like a resource for us. And, and it's really excellent because like, I don't have a business background. Like I came at this as like an environmentalist and a scientist. And so I've had to really learn as I've gone and having the, the VCs that we've had just really sort of walk me through some of the more complicated aspects of, of this has been really amazing. And I'm always really grateful for them. And the other companies they have in their portfolio, I mean, we want to work with them as much as possible. Sometimes we actually have synergy in terms of our technology and we work together in that. Like we've worked with, with plenty of companies in terms of actually doing research together and, and hiring them to do research for us or them sort of uh, working off the stuff that we're doing. And uh, that's been really excellent. And also just sort of like introducing each other to people. I mean, if you're in a network with a VC, you know, sometimes you'll, so for example, like I ended up at this set of meetings with all these large agriculture and fish producers, and one of them I know doesn't do fish whatsoever, but they do cattle. And so I 
knew there's this other company that's invested in by one of our one of our investors that does stuff for cattle. And so I was like, oh, hold on, give me your deck. I'll send it off to this corporate because I think that they'd be really interested in you. And I like, I'm going to be in their boardroom because I ended up with a meeting with them because of this program. So I can like plug this other company when I don't have any reason to plug myself. We're living, it seems, in a golden era of food tech startups. How do startups work with the large corporates and incumbents? Is, do you feel a tension? Do you feel a synergy? What's your perspective? It totally depends on the corporate. There are some who really like claim <clears throat> they want to innovate and then think that that means like new methods of advertising. And then there are some that are really genuinely interested in building something new and some that understand like this disruption is coming and they can either get on board or be disrupted. And the smart ones get on board, which is awesome. And um, it's just been really exciting. I mean, there's so many forward thinking companies out there who really, really realize that like, you know, this is going to happen no matter what. And they want to join. And a lot of them are even excited. They're like, this is great. We've been looking for an environmental solution to, to like XYZ for, for decades now. And there just hasn't been one. I know that a lot of companies are looking for ways to produce bluefin tuna. It's currently not something that can be effectively aquacultured for any sort of price that's reasonable. And so they've just been scouring the globe for ways to do that. And now we offer a solution for producing bluefin tuna sustainably. And they're really excited to be in on this more sustainable way of producing something that's extremely desirable. And I think the sustainable part is a huge driving force behind this, especially as we move towards climate change and some challenges that we're having. What are the, do you, do you have offhand or rough estimates of the stats of how much agric- uh, animal agriculture is impacting and polluting our, our planet? Ooh, that's, that's a good question. I don't have exact numbers on, on land animal agriculture. I know that there's a lot of things going on with, with sea agriculture, which are extremely problematic. So in terms of like wild caught fishing, I know that we just can't produce any more fish than we already do. We've tapped out every fishery that really exists on earth. We're at like 90% capacity. And for the past like few decades, we really haven't been able to up our production of wild caught fish. This is where aquaculture has come in. And aquaculture has been interesting in some ways because it has been able to up fish production and reduce the cost, which is great. But on the other hand, it comes with its own problems. Aquaculture still being in the water means you're still getting mercury in the food that you eat. You're still getting plastic in the food that you eat. One of the biggest problems with this is that like we still don't know what the effect of plastic on the human physiology is. We do know its effect on fish. It is not good. And uh, I think it's going to be like the next cigarettes where it's like we were all eating fish, we thought it was healthy, and then it comes out there's going to be some plastic studies in humans which are already being worked on, and it's going to be really, really bad. And so us being able to take it out of the water is really massive. I do know that because of human pollutive activities, we're going to end up with more plastic in the ocean by weight than fish by 2050 is the estimate that I've seen. So that's like well within our lifetimes. And at that point, we're going to have you know, an ocean that's completely filled with plastic. Like, what are we going to do in order to get food from that? I think we should, A, stop poisoning the ocean, and B, start to move our food sources out of it. So yeah, those are just a few things that we're doing uh, that, that, you know, mean we need to change the way we make food. Speaking of stop poisoning the ocean, I'm sure you're relatively connected to a lot of the other ocean tech type companies out there. What are some interesting things you're seeing in the space? Spoiler alert, if you're a Back to the Future nerd like me, you're going to love this. Say hello to the DeLorean. Ooh, good call. There are some really interesting companies that are making things in terms of like, there's a lot of companies that are working on this really big problem of being able to see underwater, which we're somehow just still very bad at. And so they're working on a lot of like drones that can actually see when ships are damaged and like see when we're, you know, leaking things into the rivers, into oceans and creating these, these bots with hams on their heads so we can actually like have eyes underwater. I know that there's a lot of interesting projects going on in terms of that. I also know that there is uh, currently an, an open source project going on in France where this, this, this uh, guy, I was going to say young guy, and then I realized he's like, he's exactly my age. So that's kind of a silly thing to say. This young guy, he's saying it anyways, working on a boat that is powered by trash. And so it's this really fascinating project. This guy, uh, Simon Bernard, he's working on this thing called Plastic Odyssey. And he wants to pilot this boat like around the world that's built in it. it powers itself entirely using trash and it doesn't actually end up creating pollution using the trash. It's all like completely biodegradable in, in the way that it functions. I'm not much of an engineer, so it's sort of, uh, you should get him on the show. He's fascinating. And um, yeah, really cool technology. So yeah, those are like the two things I think are most exciting in terms of, in terms of ocean tech right now. So um, there's new forms of transit essentially, and then new forms of actually being able to see what's going on down there. So we can like lessen our footprint on the ocean. We'll definitely need to look at the back to the future boat guy. So yeah, there, so there are incredible changes that are coming forward in the in the next decade, the next coming coming generation. What are some things outside of your own work that you're excited about? Outside of clean meat, I think that there are a lot 
of really exciting possibilities in the tech space in terms of like, I think one of the things that I'm most excited about is this complete decentralization of the internet and its ability for use in politics. I mean, one of the most exciting things that I, I saw happen, this was a few years ago, was during these protests in, in Hong Kong, the, the Chinese government shut down the internet so the protesters couldn't get in touch with each other anymore. And so they created this, this intranet, I guess. I'm not a computer person, so that might be the wrong word, but they just used Bluetooth to all talk to each other. And it was an app where if you turn Bluetooth on on your phone, it made messages jump from phone to phone. And Hong Kong is so dense that they just were able to communicate with each other by going through each other's phones and ending up finding the right person entirely without Wi-Fi, entirely without internet. It was just phone to phone. I think that stuff's fascinating. And it means that like, you know, it, it creates so much possibility of like decentralization of power. Because right now governments have so much power being able to censor and shut off our internet. So creating spaces where they can't touch that sort of thing is, is really incredible. And I'm, I'm very excited for technology like that. That obviously transitions to blockchain, but I want to rewind for a second. <laughs> yeah. so, so genetically modified food that's massively fought against by a large percentage of the population for different reasons. I would like to get your opinion on the, on, upon the thoughts of what's happening and why people are reacting how they are. Totally. So, you know, it's a touchy subject. There are a lot of reasons to be upset at the way the GMO industry went about putting products on the market. I think the GMO industry did not have an open and honest conversation with the public, did not really explain what they were doing. And I think that they could have mitigated this by doing this differently. So instead of using genetic modification to create products that immediately benefit the consumer, they instead created products that immediately benefit the farmer, which is more B2B. So they made things that, you know, use less water, use less pesticides, use less land. But that's very abstract for people and it's confusing and difficult to understand. Whereas instead, right now, what they're doing actually makes more sense. Like uh, Intrexon is creating the, you know, the Arctic apple, which doesn't brown. That stuff's really exciting for people. And they're working on, you know, like golden rice, which can do added levels of vitamin A for people. And that's really exciting. So I think moving GMO more into the realm of like things that immediately benefit people. And so it's sort of seen as as an actually healthy option rather than just as something that's more efficient. The reality is that people care a lot about their health and they, they care a lot about food and food is very personal. And to change that underneath people without having an open and honest conversation is going to definitely just have bad results. So we're trying to learn our lessons from that and to have an open and honest conversation with people before we hit the market so that we make sure that people understand who we are and where we're coming from and what the benefits of this are to them, not just to us. I think GMO has massive potential for saving the planet and for you know lowering water use, lowering pesticide use, lowering land use, creating like more efficient uses of land and creating new and nutritious food that people can eat that has added functionality. I think it just needs to be brought to people in the right way and in more of an, an open setting. And I think that I think that what's really important is making sure that GMO is taken into the public sector. More research should be done in public universities. More um, power should be given to biohackers to create plants in their own homes that really can, can benefit them that are completely decoupled from the capitalist system. So people don't see it as profit it's unique, but instead see it as something that you know is this really cool beneficial technology that can make the world better. I mean, would it be fair to say, essentially what, what's happening, it feels like is a lot of entitled people that aren't entirely educated on the science over reacted or got very upset by how things were done without really thinking about the implications that we were going to eat ourselves to death so that you really would not be able to have kids in the future if you didn't have a future with GMOs. Oh, totally. I mean, this attitude of like, no, like anti-GMO stuff, it's, it's very much set in privilege. And it's very much set in this idea of like, well, I don't trust it. So no one should be able to have it. I mean, you can even see that on like the really imperialist laws that Europe puts on Africa in terms of denying them access to GMOs. It's very paternalistic. And it's really, you know, there's a lot of African farmers that are crying out and, and want GMO technology because they know like their banana crops are being absolutely ruined. And all sorts of other crops are in danger. I mean, like my, my research previous to this was in this fungus called Fusarium oxysporum, which is more colloquially known as Panama disease. And it wiped out bananas on a scale so massive that actually we don't, the thing that was wiped out no longer exists. And we've just picked another plant and now call that the banana because it was so thorough in wiping out this plant. And um, this thing that we eat now was before called a Cavendish. It was just another type of plant that's sort of like a banana, like a plantain. Um, and the one before was called a gross Macal. And like this fungus is still out there. And if we don't create solutions to bat this thing off, this is going to create massive food shortages in places like like in Africa, where they do rely on large monocrops to feed themselves sometimes. And I mean, it's even dangerous for us and like our wheat, like our wheat is is large and it's it's pretty much genetically identical. So if anything comes to like knock this stuff out, we 
are in trouble. If we can't embrace new technology and new crop protection solutions, we, we, we are in trouble. But the thing that I want to say to bring this back to what you're talking about is that I guess we is the wrong word. I will never be in trouble from any of this stuff. I am a like fairly well off like white male in America. And like, I'm not ever going to deal with food shortages. And this idea of like non-GMO and not allowing this technology that can produce more food to be out in the wild just means that the people who can afford food will still be able to have it. And the people who don't have as much access to resources won't be able to eat. So it just comes from this massive place of privilege that I, that really irks me. And so I think it's important to like get conversation out there and to talk to people in their own terms about this stuff and to explain to them, not from like a corporatist point of view and not from a profits point of view, but more from a humanitarian point of view, like how important GMOs are. Hey, Mac here. If you think more people need to hear this, need to learn this information and hopefully incorporate it into their life, please consider sharing fringe.fm. Share it around. We're on iTunes and Stitcher and any bit of support helps and anything that we can do to reach more people and try to make a bigger impact is all for the better. So fringe.fm slash iTunes or Stitcher share it around and help us try to change the world. I think a big part of it's ignorance as well, just not understanding the situation or the potential pros and cons. But the, totally. the, next, the next thing I wanted to transition to before we get to blockchain, one more important, important thing is where do you see the future of farming headed? Do you see large scale farming as we have today or do you see it going on a much more consumerized basis, urban farming, et cetera? It's an interesting thing. I, I, think, I think that you know we should be doing things efficiently and I think that means large scale farming. And... I think that large scale animal agriculture is like not a winner. I think that there's really no way to scale that up um, more than we already have. We, we're pushing the limits of biology in terms of that. I think even if we start moving into things like indoor agriculture, people aren't going to be growing their own food. I mean, that's also like a, a privileged thing. Like I don't have, I don't have time to grow my own food. Like I think it'd be fun, but I'm running, I'm running finless foods over here. And like, I just don't, I don't have time to maintain a garden, even if I wanted to do that. I think a lot of people are similar, especially in America where people have to work like three or four jobs in order to get by. Those people don't have the ability to grow their own food. They don't have time. And so I think that like massive, like industrial farming, as bad as that sounds, really is the solution for that. It just, it needs to have better technologies that it can be done in a more gentle way. And closer to, closer to home, closer to where the food needs to be. I think if you can do smaller scale industrial farming around individual cities, it probably makes the most sense. Yeah, absolutely. And like the, this idea that we've like picked a dichotomy between these two things, like, oh, well, it needs to be either massive industrial farming that has that it isn't local or, you know, small scale farming in your own home. Like the answer is definitely somewhere in between. You know, we can have large scale farms near urban centers and make sure that food is actually eaten locally. Like you can eat local food from an industrial farm that's near you. Like there are crops that are farmed on a large scale close to you. So it's like the solution is like not using these buzzwords, really. I think you're totally right. The solution is like somewhere. I hate when people say this, but the solution is somewhere in the middle. You mean we don't need two political parties? So speaking of, block, <laughs> speaking of blockchain, yeah. what, uh, what are your thoughts? I, I'm not an expert. I mean, I, I've never been, I, I like computers. I like build, I build my own computers because I like, like recording music and that's the cheapest way to do that. Not much for video games. I, I, I feel coding makes me feel like I'm dying. Blockchain is really cool. I don't know how it integrates with us so much. I'm excited about it for a lot of things. I mean, I'm excited about it more on like the political side of things. It would be really interesting to, you know, say blockchain technology takes off and we all use that as our currency for whatever reason. How is anyone going to have their money kept track of? So taxes will be this sort of thing that is impossible to do on individuals, which, you know, in some ways is good, in some ways is bad. But I think that what could be interesting about it is it would force the government to consider new ways of taxing. And I think one of the most exciting aspects of that is that we could, in America, actually move to something that I've advocated for a while, which is a land value tax. Land value tax basically is like taxing land that isn't used. So right now people go into cities, they buy up massive amounts of land, and they just sit on it and just wait for the price to go up because they've created a shortage. And then once the price is really high, they sell it. Because people are creating no economic activity whatsoever. They're profiting off of basically just having money already, and they're sort of leeches on the economy. They're taking money from people who do things with it and just keeping it. So land value tax would like create a tax system where you would tax very heavily land that is owned and isn't used. So you can use it by letting someone build something on it or having um, uh, some sort of business on it or letting people live on it and creating housing. That's all usage. But if you just sit on it and do nothing, you get taxed to all hell. And so there are a lot of analysis of land value tax that show that we could actually replace the income tax with the land value tax in America and end up with more income coming into the government than we currently have. So we basically take the tax burden off of people and move it onto corporations and property owners. And I do like that because I think that people 
could use a break, at least a lot of poorer people. Although I do worry that then we wouldn't be able to tax billionaires, which I think we should do. So I don't know. I'm, I'm mixed on it. I'm not, I'm not the best source, I guess. Well, that would tax the billionaires, but it would also tax all of the people in government. So they probably would not be keen on that. I imagine they all hold a lot of real estate that they do not do much with. Yeah, it is. It is annoying how much arbitrage and just garbage there is in the economy. The same could be said with pretty much all stock trading, automation, totally. hedging, et cetera. It's, it's just arbitrage that doesn't add value. I want to transition now to something that's a little bit lighter and brighter, and that's your thoughts on the future. What industry are you most excited about? Can, can it be mine? It can, <laughs> other, other, it can we'll be go, this. We'll go outside of clean meat because obviously that's exciting, and one of the great tragedies of today is that we're killing everything we eat without quite killing it. Industries outside of my own that are extremely exciting. I would really like to say something that's not stereotypical. I mean, obviously, like AI and blockchain, machine learning, machine vision, it's all very, very cool. I, I, there's people who can say way, way cooler stuff about that than I can. I think what's really exciting is the power of machine vision and automation to plow through paperwork. In terms of civic tech, I think that it's actually extremely exciting. One of the most exciting things that I saw recently was, um, I'm going to butcher this, but the, the, the core truth of it is still there. There was this law recently passed where like loads of people in California can have their sentences reduced or, or can get out of prison because of the, I think it's the new marijuana laws. Like now that marijuana is legal in California, like, you know, all these sentences are being reduced. It might not be that, it might be something else. But basically, but there's a lot of forms that need to be filled out in order to reduce your, your sentence or in order to get off whatever your, your parole is, X, Y, Z. But there's this really great sort of civic tech incubator called uh, Code for America. And out of this incubator came this app that can automatically fill out that forms for you. So you just put in a few simple pieces of information. And it's gotten like, I think it was like 6,000 people have their sentences reduced now just because this one app got produced. And so like, and this is just able to create these solutions where you can just cut through red tape and create better, better solutions for people, which is awesome. I'm, you know, kind of, I'm anti-prison. I think people shouldn't be in prison. And like, this is a really good way to get nonviolent offenders out of prison. And it's a really great use of technology. And I wish people were focused more on, more on that side of thing and like directly improving people's lives. But you know, prison's just so profitable. Often you find the root of evil, so to speak, at the misalignment of incentives. So here we find the prison system, which is a private system where businesses are built based off of locking people up. That creates a system where more and more nonviolent offenders become locked up because large parties and influencers, i.e., people putting money into politics for less than ideal reasons can create some of the laws and regulations that affect us. This has been true in the prison system. This has been true with automobiles. This is true in pharma and many, many industries. When you find incentives that aren't quite aligned, you often find these type of problems and potentially massive solutions in businesses. There's a, there's our big, there's our big problem. A lot of time people that are doing things that matter don't have the, don't have the profit side of things down. Are yeah. there any, are there any areas like that where you see really interesting or compelling problems you would like to see solved, but that don't have great businesses or use cases or startups focused on them? Man, I wish I had thought really hard about this before we got on here. Definitely. <clears throat> I think that more open source platforms for communicating between local grassroots organizers, you know, the political organizing is something that just inherently has like no money in it. Or if it has money in it, then it's not great, right? Because the point is to organize people without money involved. We need more platforms or we need a better platform that people can communicate with and coordinate like local politics uh, and then sort of build that up into more of a national politics thing. So that would be really difficult to, to monetize one way or another, but the technology in it would be really fascinating. And then just all sorts of deep tech stuff that could be really massive for all sorts of medical purposes and our, our purposes. <clears throat> My prime example of this that I always harp on is uh, stereolithography. Like it's this crazy technology that is being used to 3D print organs in like 45 seconds to a minute. Um, and it can print microvasculature, which is really exciting. We're excited about potentially using it for what we're doing in terms of our tissue engineering. It's very hard to make this sort of thing profitable right now because it's a bit far away. And so the research really has to happen in the public sector in a pretty, in a pretty extreme way. Also, tech that can be used to like clean things up generally has to be paired with legislation. So like there's this a great company called Uva Biologics that's using this bacteria to uh, clean mine wastewater. And the only reason that their company exists is because the government basically regulated mines to like, hey, you can't dump this wastewater anywhere you want. You have to clean it. And so they created this really efficient system for cleaning wastewater. And so, you know, we can incentivize things that are not, that shouldn't be profitable, or at least that aren't directly profitable using legislation like that. When legislation says, hey, corporations have to clean up after themselves, 
that actually ends up spurring a whole green industry. So I think that what we could do is like do what Europe has done in terms of like linking corporations more to the effects of what they're doing. And in, in doing that, actually create a profitable industry out of cleaning up the mess and like capturing carbon and creating cleaner energy sources and stuff like that. That sort of stuff, I think, is a, is a, a good solution for taking things that currently aren't profitable, like cleaning up the environment and making them profitable. So we actually can get some private capital into that. So like a carbon tax credit type system? Yeah, yeah that stuff is, that's a really good example of what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think we, we have a long ways to go on that, especially with this administration. We can only hope for the next one. But <laughs> yeah. Is- Sometimes, sometimes that's how things are. Uh, part of this program, part of this program, is about exp- inspiring the the next generation, the change makers, the creators. So I want a challenge for our listeners, or an ask, something that you would like to point out or ask folks that are listening. I would find. I think that there's so many things that can be done B two B that could make a massive difference that people aren't looking at. All sorts of little tiny things that can make enormous impacts and they're not flashy and they're not sexy and they don't even seem interesting. But like, say a corporation uses like an animal, like a lot of big manufacturers use fish oil as as grease, as a lubricant. But if you could create a cost-effective lubricant that doesn't use fish, you'd be decreasing humanity's dependence on the oceans and you'd be taking us out of that and, and you know, making fish less profitable, you'd be maybe reducing the amount of fish that's caught, even if it's a byproduct, you're at least making the fishing industry less profitable, which means less fish end up being caught. (laughs) So I would say look to B2B solutions, look into the minutia of things. My challenge to people is like, look into tiny pieces of large industrial operations and find where, for me, I mean, find where animals are being used or find where like slave labor is being used, find where like unethical business practices are being used. And how can you like solve that? I mean, notice what Mike did here, by the way. Mike's building an incredible social enterprise, which is also one that will be incredibly profitable in the future. And he's calling out other entrepreneurs to do the same, to find the problems that exist in the world and solve them. This is the way that the world becomes a better place. And entrepreneurs like Mike are making that happen. Right now, there's a lot of slavery going on on in Thailand in terms of uh, shrimp processing. Can you develop a cost-effective shrimp processing machine so that it's cheaper to use this machine than to have slaves? Like there's, there's massive problems on the business to business side that could be solved through technological fixes. And I think people aren't looking at that enough. Or you could grow those shrimp, which I imagine <laughs> m- might be, might be in your pipeline, which is why that came up. I agree. Yeah. That's exactly why that, that I was like researching that basically. And I was just like, Oh my God, I was looking into, you know, shrimp production and like the cost of it. And I was like, wow, it really is cheap and looking at why it's cheap and it's slavery. So that was not super exciting. So I have one easy question for you. And by easy, I mean incredibly challenging. When will, <laughs> when will 80% of the meat that we eat be manufactured versus killed? Ooh, that's the million dollar question. I'm going to say things with varying degrees of certainty. I am 100% certain, or as close as you can get to 100%, that it will happen within our, our lifetimes. And I mean, my, my lifetime, I'm 27. I'm, I'm convinced that it will absolutely happen within my lifetime. I am fairly certain it will happen within 50 years. And I think that we can get over 50% in like maybe 20 to 30 years. Which means it'll either be a little bit longer or significantly faster because that's how technology seems to progress. Yep. And you know, this industry has exploded in the past year. It, the progress that we, we've made alone at Finless Foods has been crazy. And then also like, you know, when we started this company, we were the second company really, or like maybe like the third, we're the second to get funding. And um, now there's 13 companies working just in the meat space. So that's not counting like the egg, the egg mayo people, anything like that, the, the milk or gelatin. This is just different types of meat. Now there's like 13 companies, which is wild. And who knows how many are still down the pipeline. So this is exploding and tons of money is being dumped into this field. People understand that this is the future. So it could be accelerated way beyond what I just said. And I you know, really hope that's true. I really hope that's true as well. This is one of the, the great crimes of humanity, at least of our generation. <laughs> I totally agree. I'm a little biased, but I totally agree. <laughs> Just a little bit biased. Mike, where's the best place for people to find you online and tell you you are awesome? Yeah, sure. So we're at finlessfoods.com. You can definitely uh, follow us on Facebook, Finless Foods, Instagram, Twitter. I'm very responsive on Twitter. My, my Twitter is actually where you should definitely try and get in contact with me. It's uh, Mike Selden, F-F-S-E-L-D-E-N. I am thoroughly addicted to Twitter. I love it very desperately. So yeah, if you want to talk to me personally, that's the best way. If you want to get in touch with the company, send us an email through the website. Uh, There's a contact form and that'll go, you know, to more broadly, the company itself. Yeah. Feel free to get in touch. You can always message on Facebook. We exist there too. We're everywhere. We'll throw links and everything in the show notes, guys. Fringe.fm. Mike, thanks so much for coming on. This has been a fun conversation and hopefully it's expanded people's horizon just a bit. 
Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Matt. This was awesome. Great questions. I, I can't wait to hear it. If you want more of Fringe FM, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or go to fringe.fm where you'll find tons of audio and video interviews with leaders in the fields of genetics, cryptocurrency, longevity, AI, space, VR, and much, much more. And you can follow me on Twitter at It's Matt Ward. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a quick review in iTunes to help more people discover Fringe FM.